the home is the foundation of society. <clears throat> President James A. Garfield stated, quote, the sanctity of marriage and the family relation makes the cornerstone of our American society and civilization, end quote. And he was right about that. The home is that important. The society itself is made up of people. That's what a society is, a group of people. But the people are built, they're made in homes. When the home is threatened or destroyed, then the people, the society, will not be built as God wants them to be. And the result is that society as a whole will suffer. There can be little question today that our nation is in trouble. You look at just about any aspect, uh, and you could say that our nation is in trouble. The rising crime rate, people literally becoming afraid of leaving their homes for fear of being accosted, beaten, robbed, raped for women, killed, and people are just simply afraid because of all of the evil that is there. Many times you cannot walk in a certain area because that is someone's turf. And to walk in there on their turf is going to bring about some type of reprisals. Daily, we hear of drive-by shootings in which people just driving by and they open up fire upon whoever might be hit. Our nation is in trouble. While Roe v. Wade was overturned by the courts recently, we have seen on a regular basis now politicians coming out in support of abortion, almost in demanding that it be returned. And we have corporations who have openly avowed that they will pay for not only someone who lives in an, a state that might restrict abortion, they will pay for them to go to a state where that's allowed and pay for the abortion. And those companies are numerous at this point in time. We have politicians now, even in our state, who are saying that they support abortion, that they have the total support of uh, Planned Parenthood, which Planned Parenthood was very simply an acronym of murdering your babies that are in the womb so that you don't have any parenthood. Homosexuality has become increasingly strong, numerous, vocal. It was taught that, well, just another lifestyle many years ago. And they've tried numerous ways to justify it. They were born that way. Uh, well, they weren't. Then all of a sudden they found a gene that made them that way, which they found out that wasn't true either. But we heard a whole lot more about the gene saying that it made them that way than we did about the reversal of that and the evidence that, no, it does not make you that way. They have become, within our society today in America, 
one of the most influential interest groups that exist. You look on our televisions and the programs, you can say anything negative about religion, about God, about just about anything, but you better not say anything in a negative way about homosexuality. Because if you do, they will come down hard on you. And they will get it reversed. The list of evils in our nation could just go on and on. It could be multiplied many times over. Drug use, drunkenness, fornication, and adultery. We have an increasing problem with witchcraft in our society. The hatred, the anger that is within so many individuals today that it just is overflowing the total disregard and disrespect of authority and those in authority. Materialism itself. And as I say, you could just multiply these over and over. Our nation is in trouble. Nations cannot exist long when they leave God. Solomon put it this way in Proverbs 14 and verse 34, that righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We're very familiar with that widely known quote. And it is true when we sin as a nation, it brings reproach. We see it in our society. But a lot of times we're less familiar with what Jeremiah put and how he put it. In Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, starting in verse 7, Jeremiah writes, At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom. This is Jeremiah writing for God, of course. To pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plan it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would be benefit them. In other words, God's blessings will be upon those nations that follow His will. God's evil, that is a, and it's not evil from the standpoint of sin, from God's standpoint, it is that He's going to destroy those nations and bring about calamity upon those nations that do evil. Our nation is filled with evil and it is growing at an exponential rate. When you look at the home, just about everything begins in the home. This includes respect for authority, Obedience to the law, obedience to and respect for God and the church and that authority that God has placed in the church. But also in the home begins lawlessness and disrespect for God, disrespect for those in authority. It begins in the home. And as a child is taught in the home, that's so many times what they will become. There's an old saying that says, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. 
you bend a tree in a certain, or a twig in a certain way, it's going to grow that way. That's true in relationship to people as well and children as they are growing up. The Bible teaches parents to train thus their children. Gives the responsibility specifically to the fathers in Ephesians 6 and verse 4. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. But when children are failed to be taught properly in the home, to be brought up in the way that God wants them to go, then what we find in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 11 is true that there is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. What is that? That's disrespect of their parents. Why? Because it started in the home. And it was not taught that they had to respect their parents in the home. And thus, they curse father and mother. The result of that is going to be all sorts of evil. In Romans 1, we have dealing with the theme of Romans, the gospel is God's power to save in verse 16 and 17. In verse 18, we're told about the fact that God's uh, righteousness or is against, or God is going to be against all unrighteousness and ungodliness. Uh, he's going to punish those individuals. Then he starts in to a lengthy list in dealing with sins. And as we come down, and it's the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. So God's wrath is against these individuals. Well, look at, go down to verse 29 though. And he's giving this list and he being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, You could read that list and you could say that's talking about modern day America. But did you notice in the midst of that or toward the end of that, disobedient to parents. It all starts in the home. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, in verses 2 and verse 3, Paul would write, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, and now you have disobedient to parents again. He goes on with unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitor, Uh, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And in the midst of that, disobedient to parents. Why? Because all of those things in reality start in the home. And when they're disobedient to parents in the home and they get away with it and there's no retribution, nothing done in relationship to disobedience in the home, then the result are going to be all these other types of sin. The home truly is under attack. Brother Winford Claiborne, several years back, he he passed away several years ago, but he correctly observed that attacks against the home are so numerous and so vicious that it appears a conspiracy to destroy the home exists in our society. 
Some of those attacks against the home are theological. Others are social, political, and academic. Secular humanism has had a detrimental impact on every one of those attacks against the home. It has provided the inspiration for sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists, media personnel, liberal politicians, and theologians. I say that was years ago that he stated that. And what he stated then is even more so today. He mentioned secular humanism as had a detrimental impact on every one of the attacks. Humanism, thus, is a great evil, but many people don't understand it. In fact, some people will confuse humanism with human, human, human I can't even say it now, humanitarianism. Humanitarianism is something that is good and profitable. We should all try to be humanitarian. That is, doing good to others, showing compassion, being kind, being merciful. Those type of attributes would involve being humanitarian to others. Humanism is not that. Humanism, in reality, will destroy humanitarianism. The Humanist Manifesto, and that's the best way we know about humanism. The f there were, the first one, let me put it that way, was written in 1933. Uh, let me just state that one of the signers of that Humanist Manifesto I was John Dewey. If you're not familiar with John Dewey, if you've ever heard of the Dewey Decimal System that is used in libraries, that came from John Dewey. Uh, John Dewey had, was one of the most influential, if not the most influential individual in, educational, in the educational system in America. He was one of the signers of the Humanist Manifesto in 1933. That Humanist Manifesto in 1933 was revised in 1973. Humanist Manifesto 3, or number 2. There has been at least one more revision, possibly two revisions of that Humanist Manifesto going to center mainly upon number two. Because all of them, doesn't matter which one you deal with, begin, though, with the principle of denying God's existence. They then deny, of course, the divinity of Jesus, the inspiration of the Bible. They deny the existence of the soul, and thus a life after death whether it be heaven, whether it be hell, either one, it is denied. In the Humanist Manifesto number two, and these are quotes from that, that document, we find insufficient evidence for belief in the existence of a supernatural. As non-theist, we begin with humans, not God. Nature, not deity. Have you ever heard of those who talk about Mother Earth? Mother Earth is, from humanism, saying that the Earth is our mother. God had nothing to do with it. God didn't create man and woman. There is no God, and we should look to Mother Earth to say, for salvation not salvation from sin, but certainly another aspect of salvation. Nature, not deity. 
we should, as Christians, certainly take care of our world. God has given us a world. We are to be good stewards of all of those things that God has given us. And so we should, as Christians, take care of this world. But this world was created for man, not man for the world. There's a major difference in thinking along those two lines. It is not the world that's important, it's man that is important. Man takes care of the world because God created it and we take care of God's creation. But it's not important as man is. Yet, humanism starts with humans, not God, and nature, not deity. They have it as humanity is all that's important. Man is all that's important and nature is all that's important. But exclude God out of the picture. They go on and write, as in 1933, humanists still believe that traditional theism, especially faith in the prayer-hearing God, assumed to love and care for persons, to hear and understand their prayers, and to be able to do something about them, is an unprovable and outmoded faith. Salvationism, based on mere affirmation, still appears, now notice this word, as harmful, diverting people with false hopes of heaven hereafter. Reasonable minds look to other means for survival. Now I want to emphasize that one word that salvationism based on mere affirmation affirmation still appears as harmful now if you have something that is harmful here and we'll see some other aspects of this same principle that they're talking about if you have something that's harmful what do you do with it you try to destroy it It has been the goal of humanism from the very beginning to destroy Christianity. And that means to destroy the church. One of their most effective means, if not the most effective means, is the educational society. And go back to the influence of John Dewey thus, who signed that manifesto in 1933. Why? Because he wanted to destroy Christianity. And he is the one who has had the most influence upon our educational system. You stamp out things that are harmful. Humanism wants to stamp out Christianity. They state that modern science discredits such historic concept as ghost in the machine, and the separable soul. So there's not a spirit of man within him, a soul that needs saving, because there's no such thing as a soul. They've discredited that. Now, of course, that's all their claims. They haven't disproven these things. They cannot, but if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough, people start believing the lie. They not only disbelieve the afterlife, they actually believe that our faith in an afterlife is harmful, it's damaging. Notice this quote. Promises of immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation are both illusionary and harmful. If it is harmful, you try to destroy it. You try to do away with it. 
That's what humanism has done in relationship to religion. And that's religion in general, but specifically the church. That's what we're concerned with at this time. With God's elimination, there is no purpose, no divine purpose or value with life. Notice this quote again. But we can discover no divine purpose or providence for the human species. While there is much that we do not know, Humans are responsible for what we are or become. No deity will save us. We must save ourselves. There's no divine purpose or providence of the human species. If there's not, then why do we exist? Of what value are we? And thus, if we kill people, exterminate them, what difference does it make? They have no value anyway. Humanism devalues man. Man becomes worthless. The Humanist Manifesto 2 in 19... 73, recognize the problem of this. And so in their, pro, in their premise or preface, they referred to events since the first one that was written in 1933. And they write, quote, events since then, that would be in 1933 with the first Humanist Manifesto, Events since then made the earlier statement seem far too optimistic. (laughs) That's almost laughable because it is exactly the result that would come from what they said. But they say it makes earlier statements seem far too optimistic. Nazism has shown the depths of brutality of which humanity is capable. Other totalitarian regimes have suppressed human rights without ending poverty. Science has sometimes brought evil as well as good. Then they go on with, in the, in the choice between despair and hope, and hope, humanists respond with this humanist manifesto too, with a positive declaration for times of uncertainty. And yet, the very things which they are trying to destroy are the only things that give us certainty within life. What they promote is, in reality, that which brings uncertainty. They mention Nazism as shown the depths of brutality of which humanity is capable. Guess what? That's the result of what they teach. If you teach that man is, there's no purpose in man, no value in man, then why not have the brutality of the Nazism? Why not exterminate a group of individuals that you think is harmful for your society? They're nothing. They have no purpose. They have no value anyway. And if we try to destroy and take over the world and we bring about havoc and destruction within this world, what difference does it make? There's no purpose in those individuals. They have no value just like we have no value. What they promoted was the exact thing that brought about the brutality of Nazism. And it's not so much just that brutality which humanity is capable of. 
It's the brutality that humanism actually results in. Those are the results of it. And without God, you know, they, they talk about a positive declaration for times of uncertainty. Without God, there is no positive declaration. The only way that we can give a positive declaration for times of uncertainty is an understanding of God in the Bible and His will for us. That's the only way. And yet, they come along and say, oh no, God doesn't exist. That's harmful to you. That's harmful for society to believe that God exists, to believe that there's a life after death. That harms society. And so, what do they do? They bring about that which harms society itself and give absolutely no positive declaration for times of uncertainty because they cannot. Without God, there are no absolutes. There are no rights, no wrongs. When we watch the debate between Brother, Anth- uh, Brother Thomas Warren and then the Anthony Flute, Dr. Anthony Flute, repeatedly Dr. Warren or Brother Warren went to that aspect of morality. And specifically, did Nazis do wrong in what they did in exterminating six million Jews? And Dr. Flute never could answer the question. He refused to say, no, they didn't do wrong because he knew where that led to. And he he could not even himself go that far. But he could not say, yes, they did wrong, because knowing and saying that, yes, they did wrong, that means there's an objective standard to which they did wrong. And the only objective standard comes as a result of God, and thus the existence of God is proven. No right, no wrong without God. Morals, then, are self-determined and situational. Do your own thing as long as it doesn't harm anyone. Of course, the question then immediately comes, who cares if it harms someone else or not? Who are you to tell me not to do something based upon the fact that it may harm someone else? Who cares about them? They don't have any value anyway. Thus, There is no right and no wrong. Each person becomes a law to themselves. I do what I want to do, and no one can tell me anything different. And that's what we hear in our society on a regular basis. No one's going to tell me what to do. Because they're going to do their own thing. The desire to remove thus, or humanism desires to remove any distinctive roles between man and woman, males and females. Back when I was growing up and going to college and early in my preaching career, there was the unisex movement. We still see it every once in a while. We don't hear about it as much, but it was, it's still around. In which there was the attempt to take away any distinctive features between men and women. And there was the emphasis, you dress the same way. Get haircuts that look the same. Anything to take away any distinguishing features that would be able to determine between a man and a woman. 
Now then, from that point in time in which that was first being promoted, what we see now is that there are no genders at all. No men, no women, or they are pansexual, uh, not just simply bisexual, but they're any and all. So, and anyone can claim to be anything that they want to be. And if you, I guess if you want to change back and forth regularly, you can do that. You see, the problem that we're seeing in relationship, is there only man and woman? Well, of course not. Anyone who thinks that, they, they're old time, they're old fashioned, the science has disproven that, and you're, you're in reality, you're sick in the head if you believe that there's only two genders. Because now then we've grown beyond that. And you can be whatever you want to be. And so now then, what do we see? Little kids, when they're born. Oh, you can't tell them whether they're male or female now. They have to grow up and they can determine what they want to be when they, whenever they want to be. And we can have operations on these little bitty kids to try and alter what they are. And supposedly that's fine. And being defended by many of our politicians today. Where did it start? Humanism. Because they tried to destroy the distinction between the roles of man and woman, and now then they're accomplishing it. And you look at these young people today, and they are so messed up mentally. Why? Because they don't know. They haven't been told the truth. They've been fed a lie. They tried to destroy the limits regarding sexual freedom between consenting adults. Whatever you desire, that's fine and dandy. And so humanism and lesbianism, why that's just an alternate lifestyle, it's just fine. And if you try to argue against such, we're going to make sure you can't speak. We're going to censure you. If you say that homosexuality is sinful, can't do that. We'll cut you off from social media if you do that. And that's what they've been doing. Years ago, I made the statement that we will not only have homosexuality being accepted, but it will, be, it will come a time when we will have pedophilia accepted as well. Now then, we're at that point. Because, I said, every argument that the homosexuals make for homosexuality is the exact same argument that the pedophiles will make for pedophilia. And if you've ever looked at the arguments that are made, they are exactly the same. And thus, by the acceptance of homosexuality, which they got, they've got in our society to accept, comes naturally the next step of pedophilia. And so what happens? For example, Jerry Epstein and the one who got the young children, pedophiles, G. Sling Maxwell. Now, she's in jail, but has there been any even one person that she got the children for that have been arrested or tried or anything else? No. Why? Because it is becoming accepted. And those that she dealt with and got the children for are some of the most politically strong individuals within our nation. Nothing will be done because 
it goes back to humanism. They have sexual freedom. Doesn't matter the age of the individual. And so, doesn't matter whether it's someone who's overage or underaged. Those individuals have the right to sexual freedom. Thus, the advocacy of premarital sex, let's face it, it's hard to find nowadays a couple who are raised and they come to the marriage altar and both of them are virgins. It's almost unheard of nowadays. Why? Because of sexual freedom. That is what humanism promoted. Homosexualism, lesbianism, incest, pedophilia, all of these things went together. And then, when someone should get pregnant and they don't want that pregnancy, demand the right for abortion. Because why? There's no value in life itself. And since that life has no value, you can exterminate it. You can abort it. And what we're seeing you know, remember Dr. Kevorkian, the doc, Dr. Death, he was called. What? Well, provide people this, the ability to commit suicide when they grow older. Why? Because they become a burden on society. And in the system that we are having now, those who grow older and become a burden on society... We've been told by some politicians they just need to die because they are a burden on society. And it will come a time because there's no value in life that we will get to the point they not only should die, they have to die. And when you become that burden on society, as they say, then they will put you to death. We'll end at this point today. The Lord willing, next Sunday afternoon, we'll continue. But humanism destroys society. It is destroying us within a, as, our, as a nation. And the only way in which we can change that is by a faith in God and His existence, knowing that He does exist, and that He has given a way that is right. He's also set forth that which is wrong. And when we live that which is way that is right, that is determined by Him, then we will be blessed individually and as a nation. And so if you're not a Christian, we would encourage you to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. If you've not lived the life that God wants you to live, haven't lived that right way, then the condemnation, the wrath of God is going to come upon those who are unrighteous. And if, as a child of God, you thus see that your need, have, have that need to repent and return to God, let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can be right with Him and join in this fight for that which is right. So if you need to come, do so as we stand and sing this invitation song.